Okay, this will come as a great relief. It will be the last lecture that I give today. Uh, and then you have to wait until tomorrow to listen to my other lectures. Um, I want to talk about uh, capital and interest and time preference um, and the role that they play in, in human civilization. And I want to begin, um, it's a very simple example, um, namely Robinson Crusoe, um, who has been stranded on, on an island. And uh, we assume that Robinson Crusoe is the smartest person on earth. Um, so he knows everything there is to know about technological possibilities. He can construct any type of machine, is familiar with the latest textbooks in all sorts of disciplines. Um, so here is Crusoe. And um, the consumer good uh, that is most easily available on the island where he is stranded is fish. And because Robinson Crusoe is this very bright guy, uh, he can imagine uh, hundreds of ways how to catch fish. Um, I will only list three because I'm not the brightest guy on earth, uh, so I can only think of three. Um, so the first one is he can use his bare hands to just get fish out of, out of the river. There are plenty of fish swimming around there. All he has to do is just uh, slap in there and some fish will be produced. Then he can think of uh, producing uh, fish with the help of a net, a second technology. Um, and he can uh, think of uh, producing fish um, with the help of a boat to which some net is attached. And um, I want to raise a question. Um, what will Robinson Crusoe most likely have to do um, in order to survive on this island where there is, uh, up to this point, only uh, land, that is nature-given resources, and labor, that is his own, um, his own ability to, to work. Um, will Robinson Crusoe um, set out to begin building a boat? The answer is not very likely because after all uh, it will probably take him a few months before he would complete the boat and would then be able to reap the fruit in terms of consumption goods namely fish. And of course, he would be long dead before he would ever eat the first fish. Um, <coughs> will Robinson Crusoe begin to build the net? Um, the answer is similar. No, it might take him a week to build the net. And what would he do during that week? Um, he has to eat. Um, he cannot wait for a week without eating anything. So 
this is more or less out of the question also. So what will he most likely have to do, at least at the beginning, he will use to have to use his hands um, and he will engage what we might call into capital less production. There is no capital good in existence. Um, he produces just with labor and nature given resources. Um, now what can he then do? Let's say he catches uh, 10 fish per day. And uh, if Robinson Crusoe decides to, at the end of the day, to eat all 10 fish, then of course on day second he is precisely in the same shape that he was on day one. Um, what must he do instead in order to gradually advance his standard of living? Um, he must engage in what we call saving. Um, that is, he must eat less fish than he produced during a day. So let's say he, he eats five and he fa saves five. Um, and he calculates that it will take him one week to produce the net. Um, so then we can determine how much savings he needs in order to do what? Um, to begin to set out to produce a capital good. Uh, so seven days, uh, he has to save 35 fish um, in order to be able um, to feed himself uh, for a week and during that week he then builds this net. The saved up fish, the 35 saved up fish, are of course consumed by him also. But we can call this consumption of the fish productive consumption in contrast to uh, eating all 10 fish and then at the next day being precisely in the same position that he was in the previous, uh, on the previous day. Why can we call this productive consumption? Because after the consumption is over, uh, something takes the place of the fish that he has eaten up. Whereas in the non-productive consumption, nothing takes the place of what he has consumed. There is simply nothing left over after he's done consuming. In this case, productive consumption then after the fish are gone, he is in the position of a net. And what will now occur once he is in the position of a net? Now we can assume that the productivity of uh, his producing consumer goods will go up. Let's say he produces now 20 fish per day. If we were to assume that with a net he would also only produce 10 fish per day. 
Um, would Robinson Crusoe then have produced the net? Why should he? Um, in that case, <laughs> the entire savings activity would have been a sheer waste of time. Um, uh, being the owner of the net or not owning a net makes no difference whatsoever for him. Um, the reason why he produced the net was the expectation that production with capital goods is more productive than production without capital goods. If that is not the expectation that people have, no capital good will ever be brought into existence. So only because the expectation is, I will be more productive as the owner of a capital good, is he willing to make the sacrifice of saving. Otherwise, it would be sheer waste. What would he have to do in order to get from this stage to this stage? Again, he would have to calculate how much it takes here, whatever, a month. Um, and then he would have to engage again in savings, in enough savings, in order to allow him to bridge all the time to eat during the period while he works on the boat. And once he has the boat constructed, the, then again, the productivity of uh, producing fish will go up. If that would not have been his expectation, the boat never would have been built. Okay. So first recognition is we become richer by engaging in capitalist production, by engaging in savings and converting savings into capital goods. And we expect of capital goods that production with their help is more productive than production without the help um, of capital goods. Now, what determines the speed with which Robinson Crusoe goes through these stages? Um, the speed with which he goes through these stages uh, is determined, obviously, by his willingness to save. Um, if he would uh, save nine out of 10, uh, instead of just five out of 10, then he would reach this stage earlier. And the same again here. If his amount of savings is greater, then he will reach this position sooner than if his savings uh, is smaller standard of living will rise faster uh, the, more he, uh, the more he saves. What Robinson Crusoe here does is, in all of these cases, he exchanges a present good for a future good. What I mean he exchanges a present good for a future good is he exchanges the possible present satisfaction that he could have, for instance, by uh, eating these five saved fish right now uh, for the prospect, the future goods, of getting at a later point in time uh, a larger output. No person exchanges a present good for a future good 
unless he expects that he gets more in the future than he currently has to sacrifice. Let me just briefly explain this by a simple example that gets us immediately to interest. Here we have $100 and the question is these are present $100 and these are future $100. Would anybody be willing to exchange $100 now for a perfectly secure promise of receiving $100 in one year from now? Now, we can imagine situations where that occurs. Um, I do deals like that with my father frequently. Um, so he gives me $100 and says, you will pay me back these hundred dollars and uh, I f and frequently the situation is so he gives me the hundred dollars and I return this to him after one year. Um, but this is obviously a present that he gives me because he loves me so much uh, he just thinks that it's a satisfying deal for him. Um, but abstract from yeah, uh, benevolent feelings that you have towards other people. Um, would you then um, exchange 100 present dollars for 100 future dollars? And the answer is only if you are a moron. Um, for the following reason, if I keep the 100 dollars, how many dollars do I then have after one year? <laughs> we living on the, on the island where Robinson Crusoe is act active, okay? Um, so no taxman is around. Um, so if I have hundred dollars and keep them for a year, I also have hundred dollars. If I give it to you, perfectly certain you give it back to me, I also have hundred dollars at the end of the year. But what is the advantage of the first situation where I have the hundred dollars and keep it? Now, I am then for this year the owner of the hundred dollars. I have control over them. If something happens, I have it. On the other hand, if something happens tomorrow and I have given it to you for a year, I cannot go to you and say, look, I really need it, because you then will say, yeah, but the agreement was I can keep it for a year, so tough luck, wait until the year is <coughs> over. So in order to persuade me that I should give you $100, I would in any case insist that I must get more than $100 in the future back from you because $100 I could get myself plus the advantage of being the owner. The compensation for giving it up must be that I will receive a premium in the future. This is what we call the interest. Um, present goods uh, sell for a premium against future goods and future goods sell at a discount against present goods. And the interest rate is the premium that present goods command over future goods or the discount that future goods uh, represent as compared to present, present goods. By the way, even if there would be deflation, that is to say, that is even if these hundred dollars in the future had a higher purchasing power than the hundred dollars now, even then I would expect to get a positive interest return because once again I could hold the hundred dollars and I would also then have the higher purchasing power after one year and I would have the additional advan advantage of being 
constantly in control and being always the owner of this money instead of somebody else being the, mon being the owner of it. So every person prefers present goods over future goods and is only willing to exchange a present good for a future good if he expects more in the future than he currently sacrifices. You realize that this is also the same situation that we have at the Robinson Crusoe situation. He also exchanges a present good for a future good. And he is only willing to do this if he gets more in the future than he currently sacrifices. Otherwise, as we said, he would not build the net. Otherwise, he would not build the boat. He only builds it because he thinks the return will be higher than the sacrifice that he has to make. Now, while all people prefer present goods over future goods, not all people do so to the same degree. Uh, we call this, by the way, this preference of present goods over future goods, uh, time preference. So not everyone has the same degree of time preference. We all have time preference, but not everyone to the same degree. Um, I want to just present to you some groups, some types, and say something about their time preference, and then return to the Robinson Crusoe case. Um, children, for instance, have a very high degree of time preference. That is, they prefer present goods very much over future goods. For them, it is very difficult to delay gratification, even if the reward in the future is high. Um, people have done experiments of this sort. Again, not every child is exactly like any other. Uh, and of course, the age of the child plays a role. But if you do something like this with small children, you give them a dollar now and say, if you don't spend the dollar until tomorrow, I'll give you another dollar. And if you don't spend these two dollars until day three, then I will give you another two dollars. Um, you realize what the interest rate is that we are talking about here, okay? This is 100% per day. I don't even know what that would come to in a year. This must be an astronomical interest rate. Um, nonetheless, you will find, not in all cases, but you will find it frequently with children that it is a, an absolutely unacceptable deal um, because they are so pressed with present needs, like to go to the next 7-Eleven and buy a big gulp or a lollipop or something like that, that they can't wait for a day. Okay. So children have an enormously high time preference. Um, you can imagine that if Robinson Crusoe would have a childlike mentality, um, he might never get to stage two at all. Um, because this sacrifice that he would have to make is just simply unbearable. Or he might just ch save half a fish per day. So it might take him years before he gets to this uh, stage two. When we become adults, this is in economic terms nothing else but that we gradually lower our degree of time preference. Become, we become more future-oriented, more concerned about uh, future desires, more willing to make a present sacrifice for some greater reward in the future. What adult would not accept this type of deal? I mean, you would have to go to uh, the nut house, the loony bin, or so, to encounter people who would not be willing to do something like this. Um, then take a look at um, 
very old people. Very old people, especially if they have no offspring, uh, are frequently set to go through a second childhood. Um, they also have difficulties uh, making current sacrifices for some greater reward in the future. Why? Because they typically don't have a future. Um, they might if they have offspring, for instance, or they have institutions to whom they donate or so. But you can see that, again, if you observe old people, that they become, in some ways, again, somewhat childlike. Okay. Um, parents with children tend to be more future-oriented because they plan beyond their own lifespan. Um, I got myself a year ago in some deep doo-doo at my university because I said, uh, when I talked about examples like that, we can also stipulate that homosexuals, because they tend to have no offspring, tend to have a higher degree of time preference because life more typically ends with them. So that led to a year of investigation into my insensitivity of having said something, something like this. It tells you more about uh, American universities than it tells you about me, I think. But nonetheless, um, it was a terrible experience. Um, let me give you some other examples. Uh, c criminals have a high degree of time preference. Uh, the regular run-of-the-mill type criminals, people who hit people on the, on the head, grab their wallets and so forth. Why is that? Normally, in order to satisfy any type of desire, you have to work at least for a day. And then at the end of the day, you get your $10 or so, and then you can just drink your beer, and your wine, and all the rest of it. Uh, so you must make a sacrifice in order to have some fun. Um, what, however, if a day is just too long to wait? Um, what other possibilities are there to have fun in the short run? And the answer is, there is basically only the criminal way to have fun in the short run without any current sacrifice. Um, so criminals tend to be high time preference people. One example I always use in my class, which people always think is funny, I hope you think so, think so too, um, is um, look, imagine, imagine a boy in pursuit of a girl. What does he have to do? Now yeah, he takes her out to dinner, and then he takes her out to the movie, and uh, then he listens to a long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and then he is very impressed about the, the subject of the conversations. I mean, he has hardly ever heard anything as bright, as sharp and intelligent. And, uh, and then he has to repeat that a few times. And, uh, all for what? For the reward in the future. <laughs> so now imagine that you just can't do that. Yeah, then, then we have, uh, yes, our rapists and murderers and these types of people who are just incapable of, of tolerating this frustration that we normal men must go through all the time. <laughs> the last example, there exist also permanently poor people. I mean, poverty is a stage of life for most people, okay? When you start out, of course you are poor. You have a lousy car, live in a lousy apartment, have a lousy couch, all the rest of it. Um, and then gradually you, you struggle yourself up and, and things get somewhat better in your life. 
But then we also know people who have no uh, visible handicap who remain poor f for their entire life. They never uh, make it anyhow. Um, in Vegas, they stand on the street and say, work for food. Um, I ask my students that sometimes, ask, ask them, to, to, tell them what, what you want them to do, and then you buy them a hamburger. They all say, think you must be crazy that you ask questions like this. Um, and they send their year in and the year out, and get quite a bit of money. Um, by suckers who do not understand what I'm explaining to you right now. Um, and what do they do with their money? I mean, I've seen this, they, have, they make 30, 40, 50 bucks a day. Um, what do they do with their money? Then they go to the casino and the next day they have nothing left. Uh, and then it starts over again. Um, so what's their problem? Their problem is also they have a very high degree of time preference. There's not much you can do about it. I'm not sure if it's genetic or so, but it's an intractable problem. It's not something that you can easily solve by just talking to them and putting them in therapy or something like that. Very difficult. Um, you realize, by the way, that this is also a reason why it is wrong to believe that welfare payments will ever do anything good. If you would give these people on the streets $10,000, it would be gone in two days. Whereas for most people, of course, if you give them $10,000, yes, they have a party. Um, maybe they blow away 200, 200 of it if they are a little bit uh, gener on the generous side, but the rest of it they would put aside. Um, let me illustrate you in a different way, again, this concept of time preference. Here we have a perfectly safe guarantee to receive $100 in one year from now. But you have the right to sell this certificate. There's no doubt that in one year you will get the hundred dollars. People with a very high degree of time preference, like children, might be willing to sell that for a dollar now. Okay. If you give them a dollar now, they're perfectly happy to give you this certificate. A high time preference person would, of course, never do anything like this. So they would just insist, no, yeah, maybe I'll pay you uh, 95 you have to pay me, then I'll give you that certificate, something like this. This is just a different way to illustrate the same, the same problem. So the process of civilization, going through these stages, accumulating capital, depends largely on what is the degree of time preference that exists in societies. And that can be, of course, to a certain extent, influenced. Um, and I want to just address at least one important way in which this can be influenced, a way which is only too familiar to all of you. For that, we only introduce Mr. Friday now to this island. Now, Mr. Friday can be of two kinds. He can be just like Robinson Crusoe. Decent man comes there, uh, engages in production also, uh, whatever, maybe berry production, and then also produces capital goods and standard and division of labor sets in, capital goods come into play, standard of living rises. If a third person comes, that might also be the case, then out of living rises even higher. Yeah, but now imagine that, uh, that Friday is a mugger from Brooklyn ending up in that island. So and he sees uh, Crusoe has already built the net 
and he has plenty of fish saved so that he can in the future build the boat. And Friday then says, this is very nice that you already did that with a net, uh, which of course belongs now to me. And uh, very good that you did already some savings. Um, they belong to me now too. Uh, or if he is a, a little bit more moderate, more like governments are, um, he says, that's good that you are a productive person, but of your output with the net, 50% uh, is of course now mine. Uh, and the savings we split even. After all, I'm a person, you are a person, everybody deserves the same. Um, now what sort of effect will that have on the future process of capital accumulation that takes place on this lovely island? Um, no, the answer seems to be clear. Uh, Robinson Crusoe will of course have a diminished interest in saving and capital accumulation and an increased interest in consumption. After all, whatever has been consumed, nobody can take away anymore. Whatever anybody has saved and done in terms of capital accumulation is subject to expropriation, full expropriation, or partial, partial expropriation. Um, when we want to explain now why it is that there are some countries that are poor and other countries that are rich, then we have here in a nutshell, the explanation for this fact in front of us. Um, countries that are rich are countries in which a huge amount of capital accumulation has taken place over time. And countries that are poor are countries in which there exists very little in terms of capital accumulation. And what is the reason why some countries have lots in terms of capital accumulation and other countries have very little in terms of capital accumulation? And the answer is, by and large, the security of private property rights in these places. Uh, not necessarily the security of private property rights as it exists right now, because capital accumulation takes, of course, time. Um, private property rights are no longer secure in the United States, nor are they secure in Denmark, nor are they secure in Germany. After all, here we have the case of governments uh, robbing productive individuals of roughly 50% of what they have produced. But most of the capital goods from which we still benefit have, of course, been brought into existence not by us, but by our forefathers. And our forefathers have frequently operated, were allowed to operate under far more favorable conditions than the conditions under which we have to operate. So we cannot necessarily say that a country that is currently rich is a country in which private property rights are respected. We can only say a country is rich because somehow in the past, private property rights must have been respected in that country. Whether that is still the case is an entirely different question. And we can also not necessarily say that a country that is poor is a country where private property rights are currently not respected. All we can say is a country is poor because private property rights in the past must obviously not have been respected, otherwise they would be richer. Which brings me to the topic of capital consumption. Capital is, of course, not consumed in a literal way, but all capital goods wear out. The net will break, the boat will break, and so forth. And if societies do not continue to save, uh, then they are not even able to replace these worn out capital goods at the moment when they, yeah, when they are broken. Uh, not to speak of improving their standard of living. Then they go through a crisis. That is, capital goods wear out and nothing is there to take their place. This is, of course, what we have seen 
in places like the former Soviet Union and the entire East Bloc. Yes, these countries inherited, of course, a stock of capital goods. Uh, and capital goods can last for quite some time. Uh, a house can last, whatever, 100 years, 200 years. Um, I remember still when I gave lectures in the Soviet Union at some time, they had, they had machines that were built by Krupp in the 19th century, um, still, still working. That uh, was, of course, Krupp Stahl. Um, not the Stahl that the Russians themselves produced. Um, but even those things will eventually wear out. And what motive was there in those countries for people to save where you cannot even own capital goods yourself? And the answer is there is very limited motive for people to engage in savings in places like this. And what will you then see eventually? You will then eventually see a collapse in the standards of living. That the Soviet Union could last as long as it did. I mean, there are other problems which have to do with the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism. But another important reason, the one that I want to address, uh, is, again, after World War II, the Soviet Union, again, thanks to American generosity, inherited, of course, large part of Middle Europe and Eastern Europe. Again, come into position, in the possession of a huge stock of capital goods, which again, took a long time to just yeah, wear out, uh, get consumed, and then in the end, the big, big collapse in terms of um, uh, living standards, uh, living standards ensued. Uh, so drastic, that's something that should be, one, one should be reminded that in all other countries in the world, no, not Africa and so forth, but in the Western world, standards, uh, life expectancy has continuously gone up. Um, in, in the former East Bloc countries in the last 20 years of their existence or so, especially in the Soviet Union, life expectancies actually fell. Um, such a drastic deterioration of the general uh, living conditions ensued due to the fact that in a system where there is no private property in factors of production, no private capital ownership, there is simply no incentive uh, to bring capital goods into existence and to save. Um, so to sum it up, it is of utmost importance to have societies that respect private property rights because only in those societies are there strong motives for people to save and invest and only in societies where saving and investing um, is taking place, will standards of living continuously, continuously rise. With that, I'll, I'll finish this lecture, and I thank you again for, for your patience with me. Take a few questions. Well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your lecture. My name is Kim Eskelson. I just have one comment. Um, you said that you won't save for the future unless you gain more in the future. I slightly disagree. If, for instance, you might save for the winter if you live in a cold country like Denmark, or you might save for your pension without necessarily gaining more. I mean, if you have a bad pension system or anything, like we have here, for instance. So um, I slightly di disagree with you, but maybe you can uh, explain the theory to me. Again, you, you, say, for the, you say for the winter or what? Yeah, for instance, if you can only harvest uh, during the summer, like here up north, 
you have to have something to eat during the winter. So you, you save your, your grain for the winter, so you, have, you can make bread and so on. That doesn't necessarily mean that you will, uh, the, it, of course in a way it will be worth more because you're in a situation where you haven't have enough, you won't have enough for the winter, you won't have enough food. But I mean, you save because you're going to lack, lack it otherwise later. Yeah, those are in a way different goods to have, uh, to, uh, to, to have grain in the winter where there is no grain growing is a different good than having grain in the summer when it is growing. This is like the same thing, ice, ice cream in the winter is a different good than ice cream in the summer. Um, so I, I don't think that affects really what I, um, what I try, to, try to explain. Thank you. Uh, this might be slightly off topic, but was John Maynard Keynes a uh, homosexual? <laughs> no, his famous mantra, you know, in, in, in the long run we're all dead. I just wonder if there was some reason for this famous. Now, yeah, you see, like this again might get me into trouble because I said that in my lecture also, um, the, one, the, the one where then a complaint was filed against me um, that I had discriminated against some people. Um, John Maynard Keynes was also a homosexual. Um, and I, in this lecture, I said, you know, in a way that might explain his attitude to say, in the long run, we are all dead. Because if, for most people that I know, I mean, it means. A, a, heterosexuals with children, that's not their attitude. I mean, my parents would not say, in the long run, we are all dead. That's the thing. They, they are constantly concerned about what happens to me and what happens to their grandchildren. Um, so even if they say, I might be dead, but you go on, uh, and I'm concerned about you. Um, so yes, I'm not saying that that is uh, that that is an explanation that cannot be disputed. I'm just saying that this is a plausible, plausible interpretation. Um, in the same way as, uh, let's say, when we look at the movie like the Passion of the Passion of Christ, you know, this Mel Gibson movie. Um, yeah, does it help us? to understand this movie when we know that Mel Gibson is a devout Catholic? And I would say, yeah. Is that an important information that you tell people Mel Gibson is a devout Catholic when you just watch that movie? I think that is an interesting tidbit of information that might, you, might help you to interpret the movie uh, in a more knowing way than you otherwise would. And by pointing out that Keynes had these inclinations and then saying, and then look at his book, where all, all of his um, uh, policy prescriptions are basically, whenever you have a problem, uh, print more money. Um, in the long run, we are dead anyway. Um, well, all of his, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the guy has statements, if we, if we print enough money and the population doesn't increase too drastically, then in one generation, we can eliminate the scarcity of capital. You know, then, I, I have always been wondering how anybody could take a, a person like that seriously. You will not find that in any discussion of Keynes where they just quote these sorts of nonsense things that he says in, his, in, 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 in the general theory. But he does it. In my, I have written some articles on Keynes where I have all these idiotic quotations all collected. Um, I think Yes, the men can be understood far better 
if one knows these certain things about his, uh, his personal background. There are other things about his personal background that also help you, uh, it helps you in understanding some of his uh, philosophies, that he considered himself to be an immoralist to whom the normal bourgeois standards of good and bad do not apply. Um, uh, which again explains many of his proposals. For instance, he has a proposal, uh, what we should bring about would be uh, the euth euth euthanasia of the rentier class. Um, the rentier class are those people who can live of interest. Um, yeah, they should all be euthanized, according to Keynes. They should be wiped out. Um, so there are many awkward statements, and I think knowing something about the personality sometimes helps illuminate why certain people say certain things. Not in all cases. I mean, there is no, there is no determinism involved, involved here. But things like this, I think, should be legitimate in a, in a conversation to say. Uh, from what I understood, you say that consumption is bad? No, and, uh, I would not say consumption is bad. As a matter of fact, you say <laughs> we only produce in order to consume. Um, if you, I mean, there's nothing bad about consumption. Only if you want to increase your standard of living, if you want to be able to consume more, then it is necessary to save and to engage in capital accumulation. Okay. Consumption, from my knowledge, is giving a boost for uh, economical growth. And then also, you said about... Uh, no, but consumption, you see, like consumption can never boost economic growth. Consumption only diminishes something. Consumption is, and w w once this glass of wine is consumed by me, there's nothing left that cannot give a boost to anything. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's why we consume, right? But in but in order to have the next the next glass, I must have had already the savings uh, in my in my wallet, or Hubert must have had the savings in in his in his wallet. So we must have engaged in other activities except consumption. Consumption just evaporates things, makes things go away. Th there's nothing wrong with that. It gives but money to be more produced, no? No, it doesn't give more money. Look, it, 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 first I have to earn the money in order to, production must come before consumption. Yeah. Okay, that's, 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 that's a key insight. It is not, it is not that, we cons that, we, uh, uh, that we consume uh, something that has not been first produced. First things must be produced, first we must work, and then we can consume. And then also uh, about Eastern Europe, I, from my knowledge, they were saving money. There was another problem. The money didn't really have any value, but... Because they had maximum prices. Because it was something else, of course. Yeah. Uh, the m prices were controlled and everything. Yeah, but you cannot really call that savings because there was no outlet for it. And say, yeah, yes. Yeah. Look what these countries did was they imposed maximum prices on almost all basic, f basic goods and at the same time they created tons of money. Um, so uh, the effect of that was that people had huge amounts of money in their savings account because there was absolutely no good on which you could spend this. This ruined then partly West Germany after the reunification because dumb dumbs as the German politicians are, they just decided, okay, we uh, first up to five thousand dollars, uh, five thousand marks, we exchange one to one, even though on the on the black market the East German mark was on a fifth of what the West German mark was, and above above a certain sum, we exchange whatever. Uh, one to two or one to three, not knowing 
not knowing that East Germans they had bank accounts with 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 marks, just, just paper sitting around there, for which, for which nothing could be bought. This is, I don't know if you have seen it, uh, Keynes and the camel, in the long run we are all dead. 